My name is Harold Ruddish. I'm a veteran of World War II. I am 99 years old and still feel healthy. Uh, I was drafted in 1943 and I left the service in 1945. I did my basic training in Camp Shelby in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, which was um, an opening, an eye opening for me, going from New York to Mississippi and hearing all the different uh, dialects and uh, I couldn't understand some of the people there. Uh, I was in the basic training for about close to a year. Uh, they started a new kind of thing for the infantry and that was a cannon company that uh, part of the regiment would have a cannon company so there would always be a howitzer with it so it could always have artillery. When they opened that up they appointed me as a, uh, a I was a sergeant and I became a reconnaissance sergeant and it was quite a a busy job in that I had a group of men that followed me. I was assigned a jeep, I was assigned a, 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 a howitzer that I was in command of, and I would look for targets, we would go out. This was all during training. After a while, I was sent overseas. I went as a replacement. The unit didn't go together, so we were broken up and I went as a replacement. I came into uh, uh, on the Queen Elizabeth and it was such a big ship that we had to go into Scotland, into the Firth of Clyde. Uh, this was a ship that we had a closet. I remember living in a closet with five other men. It was just in the closet, berths just set up. Uh, from there, we got into, on the railroad, we went down a, a few miles to a camp, which was basic for us, where I joined up with other uh, recruit not recruits, replacements. And the replacements were going to different areas and different groups. I was assigned to the 90th Division, part of the 3rd Army, as a reconnaissance sergeant, I kept my grade, and it was a different kind of job at this point. I joined the group in uh, England, and we stayed together for a while, and it took quite a while for the group to, they were together for a while, so I was a new guy, and it took a while for them to get to understand me and trust me. From there, we went to the Normandy, but we were there luckily about a month or two after the invasion. From Normandy, we went up to Metz. We joined Metz, and we joined at Metz. And from then on, I was working with the 90th Division as a recon sergeant. Why don't you tell me a little bit before the war in your early life, if you could share some memories from your childhood, and what was your family like? My family was entirely non-military. They were very, very unhappy when I got drafted. In fact, I gave them an excuse that I was going to be uh, not in the um, armed forces, really, that I would be uh, doing a different kind of work and just wearing a uniform. I had a bad back. Uh, I still have a crooked spine in a way, so I used that to assuage my mother that I wasn't going to be in battle. Uh, we were, the background was that the, they came from Poland and they, we all spoke Yiddish all around, the whole family did, and then uh, I had, by the time I had gotten into the service, by the time I had dra been drafted, I was in my 
freshman year in college. I wasn't doing too well, so I wasn't unhappy when I got drafted. I had a younger brother, he was 10 years younger, and he was the boy or the man that wrote the letters for my family. They didn't understand the English that well, so he did the writing. Before you got drafted into the military, do you have any specific dreams or any aspirations for your future? Do you have any plans? What were your plans? Yes, I had plans. I wanted to be an architect. That was my planning that I wanted to do. And uh, I didn't get into architecture because I don't, I don't know why what happened in between. But my whole span of life was really luck. Well, let me tell you, from the beginning, when I was in junior high school, it was a tough school and I was get getting beaten every day. So what I had to do was take the lunch that my mother gave me and gave it to the biggest guy I knew there, and he took care of me. In the eighth grade, someone came to me and said, you know, Harold, we don't have to stay here for the ninth grade. In Manhattan, there's a school called the Hebrew Technical Institute that starts at the ninth grade and it goes through high school. And if we can get in there, we'll be in shops, we'll learn how to use our hands, we'll get credit, we'll get high school credit, etc. Well, I got in there and in the first year I did very, very well. Beginning in the second year, uh, you have to remember this was a time the war was going on in Europe, but not in America. Uh, America wasn't, it was just supplying Europe. But in Europe, the institution, the uh, Hebrew Tech, was operated by a German uh, Jewish organization. And they had to take care of the refugees in, uh, in Europe so they couldn't keep the institute. What they did was they sold the Hebrew Technical Institute to New York University. It was in that area. And here's another bit of luck. The university said whoever attended the Hebrew Technical Institute would have a four-year scholarship. Amazing, you know, it helped me get in and uh, otherwise I don't think I would have gone to college. And that's where I was drafted from while I was at NYU. So training and camaraderie, can you recount some experiences from training and how did the bonds with fellow soldiers form during this time? The bond between different. I don't know if we really had a bond. We worked together, but every so often, a group of men were taken and sent overseas, so that it wasn't. If you, we, I was there about a year, year and a half at basic, but I didn't meet with these guys all the time. I would be with them for maybe three months, and then they'd go. Luckily, I didn't get sent till towards the end. Uh, this was in 44, I believe, I was sent overseas. Uh, I had some pretty good friends that we got along. Uh, I also had, in fact, I was a big shot as a as recon sergeant. I had a jeep assigned, I had a driver assigned. I was almost like an officer. And I did very well. I used to set up training schedules. I set up uh, little bombs and trees and set them off as guys went by so that they would know how to duck and how to take cover. So can you take us through your deployment experiences? What were some of the most challenging and memorable moments during your time in Europe? The most challenging times, there were a few challenging times. One was in the Ardennes forest, where the Germans were shelling like crazy. They weren't shelling directly at us, but they were shelling at the trees, so that when what their shells would hit the tree, it would explode and everything would come showering down. It was a tremendous amount of uh, pieces of steel would come down at you. But we got in and the, we got into foxholes. 
That was the most important thing. One of the most important things was not the gun we carried, it was the shovel we carried. We were constantly digging to find, make a, shot, uh, a foxhole or find one. That, that's what helped us quite a bit. Uh, I can remember just before Bastogne, there were three of us in a foxhole. The foxhole was covered with logs. We couldn't move. Somehow the Germans had us zeroed in. If we moved, there was a shell that hit close by. In fact, one shell hit and a piece went through and hit a man in the backside. I opened, I tore his, uh, his uh, garment off and I looked and I said, you got a million dollar wound. It just hurts a little. If we get out of this, you'll be going home. Uh, at that time, we were at a point where the Germans were getting ready for Bastogne, and I could hear movement, constant, day and night, soldiers and equipment moving through an area I couldn't see, but I could hear. I couldn't get close enough. We had uh, Piper Cubs, little planes that were checking and sending our, uh, uh, artillery shelling them but there were huge numbers of soldiers, Germans, moving through to go towards Bastogne. Um, how long were you in Europe itself for? I must have been in Europe for about, I would say six months. It was a short time. Uh, of the six months, I was close to four months as a prisoner of war. Now that was a, an adventure in itself. I was with a, uh, a company that was moving ahead of the troops. We were prodding the Siegfried Line. Now the Siegfried Line was on the border between France and Germany. And going back into Germany, that line was so fortified, there were 17 miles back of uh, uh, things that would stop a tank, pillboxes, all kinds of concrete structures that were armed, so that if you had to go to fight them, you had to go through a, a massive fire that you had to get through. My outfit one night was told that we're going to go in and take a pillbox. Now a pillbox is a concrete, uh, a concrete room in a way, but the important part about that is it has a gun on top. If you capture that pillbox, you're a command of a little area. When, we, when we, we would work at night, we'd get around the pillbox, get to the door, and put a charge on it, and blow it in, and then go flying in with our guns, and knock out whoever was there. And then the next day, the other troops could move up because we had control of that area. But we got into a pillbox, which wasn't really a pillbox. It was a German sleeping quarters. It was a big concrete structure underground. There must have been 40 Germans there that were our prisoners. But where could we go? There was a steel door that we had to close because they were shooting at us. They found that we were in there. and. <laughs> Every, every night they would sneak up, we'd hear them come up and a bazooka would blow the door in, a couple of guys would take and push the door back. And it was a little hole or a little window, couldn't see, it was dark, but we would shoot there so that nobody would get in at us. About the fourth day, we, we had no food, we had no water, things were pretty bad. We heard somebody say early one morning, do you have wounded in there? And that was in a German accent. And the lieutenant that was with us said yes. And they asked him to come out. The firing had stopped. He went out, he checked, he came back in and he said, Ben, you can't go any place. There's nobody of our troops here. It's all Germans. We can't get anywhere. By that time, we were uh, sick of not eating. 
We had no water. And being afraid of the Germans, that I, I was Jewish, so I was afraid, I took my dog tags and I threw them away. It's not heroic, but it, I think it may have saved my life. Ben, can you explain why you threw the dog tags away? I threw the dog tags away because this was a time when the Germans were just killing Jews. The, there was a time when they were putting Jews in, in uh, 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 camps. They were burning them in, in ovens. They were putting Jews in ghettos. And my dog tag had H stamped on it, which indicated I was Hebrew or Jewish. After being captured, they moved us down to their front line and that they sort of welcomed us in a way. There were a lot of kids, youngsters, as soldiers. It was the end of the war from, for them, close to the end, and they knew it already. As we traveled back to the prison camp, it was very difficult in that our artil artillery had fields marked out where they just shot every half hour, every hour, and we had to listen and be very careful that we didn't get hit by our own artillery. When we got back, the first place we were put in was a regular prison with bars and uh, steel doors, etc. That wasn't too bad because uh, they fed us there. There was soup, hot soup, uh, and things of that nature, which was good. From there, we had to get transported back to a regular prison camp. There, we got into these cattle cars, these gigantic freight cars. There must have been 90 to 100 men in the car. We were just pushed up against each other. And as we went back, the American Air, Air, Air Corps saw us and they would shoot. They didn't know we were prisoners, but they would shoot at the drains. So we just waited and after a while, they got the cars into tunnels. So we were safe for a while. This was February and it was cold. We got to the prison camp, but we got there too late at night for them to let us in. So we had to stay outside. And I remember distinctly laying on a pile of hay, just freezing, because what did we have? We just had a jacket and that was it. Guns we didn't have anymore. Uh, backpacks they had taken away, whatever we had. So I was laying there overnight. The next morning, they took us into the camp. And then that night, or later in the afternoon, they interrogated us. The interrogation was such that the man, or he was an officer of some kind, interrogated me in the best English I've heard in years. Very, very good. And I asked him, where did you learn your English? He said, well, I went to the university in the United States. Then I came back to Germany to teach, and I got in the army. His questions were such that, what was your company? Where were you from? How many men? And I didn't answer as quickly as he wanted, because all I was supposed to do was give him name, rank, and uh, number, service number. So he says, ah, all right. He turns around, pulls down a window shade behind him, and on that window shade is listed everybody in my company. Everybody. Those that had been wounded before, those that were officers, plain men and all. He says, I don't need your information. Then he kept asking me, Radish, Radish, what kind of name is that? I knew what he was trying to get at, so I said, well, it's British, like Pepper. And he, ah, he laughed, yeah, 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 yeah. Then he gave me a loaf of white bread, which was supposed to be very good. And that sort of was to tell the other soldiers, the other men that I was with when I got back to the barracks, that I had given him information. But that wasn't such, because everybody that was <laughs> interrogated got a piece of white bread, a, a real loaf of bread. Interestingly enough, I had a partner, 
J.J. McEntee, and we took care of each other. The guys that didn't have partners, one guy had that white bread and he slept on it. He got up the next morning, the part that wasn't under his head was cut away and taken by a fellow soldier. The life in the prison camp was regulated in a way. There was a couple of master sergeants that ran, sort of ran our outfit. Every morning we would go out and line up and they called it appell, you know, call, name. And at there they would announce who was sick, who died, who passed away, and what we were supposed to do for the day. The, and after that, we went back into the barrack. The first, I, I would say, three or four weeks, I was so stricken with having to move my bowels, something about the food that I didn't get or whatever was going on. And it was interesting. They didn't have a toilet. They had a concrete floor with holes in it. And you stepped over the hole and that was your, your toilet. As far as food was concerned, we did get bread every morning. But it was a small loaf, oh, about this size, about eight, nine inches by about three or four inches. But that was for 12 men. Every morning, uh, somebody would pick a card. The guy that got the high card would slice this up into 12 even slices because we watched him cut that bread. That was important. Now, why did he slice it? Because after he gave out the slices of bread and took a slice for himself, he could keep the crumbs. That was extra. Occasionally, we got a Red Cross package. And in the Red Cross package, you had uh, Spam, you had uh, powdered uh, juices that you could mix with snow or water. Uh, you had uh, kiln, that was milk, powdered milk, which was very important for us because, well, uh, I, I, I didn't realize it, but then one guy had a birthday and they showed us how to take our little scrum pork little pieces of bread and mix it up with powdered milk, make the milk thick, and it ended up like a cake. And in the Red Cross package was also M&M's. So if we had a birthday cake for the guy who had a birthday. It was quite interesting. Uh, the guards, they were older people. They didn't bother us very much. I did occasionally speak Yiddish to them, but they realized that it was a, a type of German that they hadn't heard before, so they figured I learned it in the backwoods someplace, and they never bothered me. Although one time, we were going from one prison camp to another. We had to move because there were armed forces of our side coming up. So whenever you moved to a different camp, what you did was that you had a blanket, everybody had a blanket, whether it had holes in it or anything, you had a blanket just to keep you warm occasionally. And what you did was you put all of your, whatever you had in your pockets on top of the blanket. What you didn't want them to see, you dug a hole under the blanket and put it under the blanket. I made a mistake at that point. We were sitting for quite a while and somebody came by and I didn't realize it. This man was a soldier, a German soldier, but he had a white shirt on, meaning he was an SS man. And when I said to him, wie lang? He looked at me and he said, Jude, Jew, you Jew, verfluchter Mensch, Wall Street, you started the war. I almost passed out. I was afraid that something was gonna happen. But luckily somebody called him and nothing happened. Uh, my men came around me and said, Radish, well, what was wrong? We never saw you like this. I said, forget about it. No more talk. <laughs> uh, it was a difficult time. We, cigarettes were better than money. We could bribe the guards with two cigarettes. They would bring you an apple or a, a, a 
potato or whatever. Uh, our sweaters were very important to them. If we gave them a sweater, they would strip the wool out of it and the women would, in the town would do something with it and somehow they'd bring us something. The getting along in the prison camp after a while was just a matter of waiting and waiting. Not knowing what's gonna happen, but we waited. There was an incident, I remember being in a place and seeing a man talk to the wall. And I said to myself, well, it's not unusual. A lot of the guys had problems. But all of a sudden, he raised his hands up and pulled the block out of the wall, and then he yanked out a loaf of bread. So I looked at him and I said, what can you do for me? He says, what do you have to trade? I said, well, I have an extra pair of pants that I'm wearing. He says, all right, go ahead, change. But give me the pants and you get out of here. And then when I came back, he gave me a loaf of bread that he must have gotten from. What else he got, I don't know. But he gave me the bread and I took it to my partner, J.J. McEntee, and we watched that bread. Some incidents I remember, uh, we were in the... Uh, the cattle cars and we were going from one camp to the other and all of a sudden the air corps came by and started shooting. At that point we had a Red Cross w with us, a Red Cross package and there was food in there between the two of us. So while they were shooting we started eating like crazy. When the shooting stopped we put the food back. Uh, it was a matter of waiting. The worst part about the prison camp was the pests, the lice. They were all over your body. I had never, never known anything like that. And it was terrible. Every morning you'd get up if you could sleep and you'd snap these things and kill them as much as you could. They were always all over you. That was the hard part, the lice. At the new prison camp, we were there Oh, for maybe about a month or so. We, one night, uh, a couple of guys came in, American soldiers with SP or whatever, MP on their uh, sleeves, saying, you can't move tonight. The British are very close. They're coming up. The next morning, there were no Germans around. They were just British. They came in. They had brought a naffy cart, which was like a Red Cross cart, with noodles, and that made us happy so we could eat. But we were told, be careful, don't eat too much. Your stomach is not ready for a lot of food. So we had some food, and then the big thing that they did for us was the lice. They took us out in a field and took a, a shaver, like you shaved a sheep. They shaved our whole bodies clean and sprayed us with DDT. That, at that time, was very good. So, got rid of all of the, the lice. Gave us clean British uniforms. The stuff we had, they took and burnt. I waited there for about a week. And afterwards, they put us in a plane and flew us to Brussels, where I rejoined the American Army. The worst part of the pri prison camp is not what happened to me. The worst part is what happened to my parents, to my mother. She got a letter missing in action, a telegram, missing in action. Yeah, there's a letter over there. Maybe you made a copy, I don't know. And that, when I saw her, when I came home and saw what she looked like, I was hurt. I felt I had done something terrible. They had no way of knowing where we were, whether we were alive or dead or wounded. And that was, that's how it ended up as being the hardest part of the prison camp. Otherwise, you know, you get along, you do what you have to. You listen, you work with your buddy who helps you out, and that's it. What, where was this prison camp that you were in? It was in, in Germany, just over the border. It was Stalag 12A, and 12B was the second one. I, d I don't know the exact town. But uh, that's, that's, that's where it was. Did the, did the Germans ever kill or, or abuse 
prisoners, or was that not? Common? I never saw them abuse anybody. I, I really didn't. But we had so many men in these cattle cars that when we got to wherever we were going and the doors opened up, they were dead men, people that had died, soldiers that had died in the cars. And then when we got out, they had their German shepherds barking at us and we had to rush and get out of the way. We were afraid they were going to bite us. They were just, you know, moving us along. When you guys surrendered to them, was it a peaceful? It was a peaceful, yeah. It was sort of fr frontline soldiers uh, realizing what was happening to both of us. It was peaceful. They showed us pictures of their family. These are, they were kids. Well, we were kids too, but they were kids also. Showed us pictures of their families. All they wanted was the powdered uh, drink, because food they had as little as we did. So they wanted the powdered so that they could mix it with snow and have drinks and stuff. Yeah, both sides didn't really want to fight, you know, they were just kids. Well, it got to a point where they felt that they were losing and they knew it. They were finished. At the beginning, they were stuck, you know, Deutschland over all us, Germany over everything. They thought they were the, the conquerors of the world, you know. But the prison camp, oh, it was very cold. There was a little stove, and we slept on beds like, uh, what would you call them, cubs or uh, whatever, bunk beds. One, two, three, height, and I slept on the top. And as the days guy took a, and they were made of wood, so you took a slice of wood and put it in the bed. By the time we had left the place, I was down on the floor, and we'd used up all the wood. It got, you know, it got warm. Uh, we got along somehow. We knew what we had to do. It was a lot of picking lice, sitting around, being careful and that you didn't get out where you weren't supposed to be. There was always American planes shooting right around us, and there was an electric fence that you didn't go near, and you, you took care of yourself. And how was it when the, when the British came? Were they, you must have felt like extreme relief it was extremely, extreme relief. It was very nice. They were very nice to us. Hi, Yank, how are you? Go up and eat, do what you can, you know. And they took care of us. They made sure we were clean, gave us good uniforms, uh, took care of us. The prison camp was just waiting, not knowing what was going to happen, but waiting as to what would happen. What was the average day at the camp? The day at the camp was you, you got up, uh, there was noise, so you got up. Somebody was bringing in a barrel of what they called soup, which was just lick water with some vegetables in it, and then they gave out the breads. And at that point, you started cutting up the bread, and that was for the day, that slice. Soup, you had it, huh? One piece of bread for the One piece of bread, yeah, that was it. And somehow, we saved a little piece from that piece of bread. And then there was soup, so-called soup. We were able to keep a piece of bread. The uniform that you had was you had a blanket, you had a cup. Wherever you went in the prison camp, if somebody was giving something out, you stuck your cup in there. You get a piece, you get some juice or whatever they had. When we got the Red Cross packages, it was interesting. Pretty much the Red Cross package had been opened before. Everything was in there except the chocolates. Somebody stripped the chocolates. And who stripped it? It was one of our guys that was distributing. Because at the end, when the camp was sort of open and there were no Germans, we got into the storage lockers and there was one locker full of chocolates, you know. So somebody was hiding and dealing. It was a matter of keeping your wits about you, being quiet, not getting too involved, but thinking all the time, what, what's the next step? 
And my biggest fear was being found out that I may be Jewish, you know, so I was afraid of that. Were there other Jewish soldiers with you that you knew of? I didn't see any, honestly. The guy I was with, J.J. McEntee, was an Irish kid who didn't smoke, which helped. We used his cigarettes for whatever we had to do. Oh, cigarettes. It was money. We couldn't go out. The Germans apparently were following the Geneva Convention, and we were non-commissioned officers. I was a sergeant, and the rest of the guys were either corporals or sergeants. So they didn't let us go to work. But there were men that were allowed to go out to work. They went out on farms, etc. When they came back at night, which was maybe 4.30, 5 o'clock, it was like a Wall Street. They would walk by and a guy would hold up a potato that he had stolen. And you put up two fingers or one finger. You were dealing with him. You were saying one cigarette or two cigarettes. So they knew somehow how many cigarettes you had. So at that point, if it was okay, he'd throw you the potato and you'd throw the cigarettes. Every night in the evening. That's what we were doing. Yeah. Did you, did you lose a lot of weight? Weight, yes. I lost about 20 pounds. For a short period, I was only there about four months. I must have weighed at 145 when I went in there. And then I ended up maybe 120 or something like that. Everybody had lost weight, pretty much. The, it was a matter of waiting, just waiting. And as I said before, the pestilence, the lice, that was the hard part. Looking back, how do you believe your wartime experiences shaped your life? Are there specific lessons or values that stayed with you? Well, in a way it shaped my life in that I, when I started to do something, it had to get done. I didn't start anything and leave it. I had to do it and get, get done. It shaped my life in a way that I got up every morning, I washed, I cleaned, I was ready for work, or as in the service, I was ready for action, whatever I had to do. In a way, it shaped my life in telling me that I was a pretty lucky man. I had lived through some very tough experiences, the prison camp, uh, being shot at, being bombed, artillery, and still I was alive. I, and then you have to remember, I was what, 19, 19 and a half at the time. In my mind, what could happen to a 19-year-old guy? You're always going to be okay. So, living through World War II and fighting in World War II and seeing the atrocities against Jews, do you see that anti-Semitism that you experienced back then, do you see it coming back in today's world, today's society? I see it coming out in the open war. Anti-Semitism has always been around. And that it's people that hate other people. You could be uh, white hating blacks. Anti-Christians, very, very orthodox, not liking Jews. Uh, I, I, I couldn't understand what anti-Semitism was until I got into Europe and I saw the ghettos and I saw the camps. I realized that they were just trying to get rid of a Jewish people completely by killing, by burning, and not, not wanting them to live. And as somebody who fought for America during World War II, fought bravely, uh, against Nazis, do you, do you see people, you, we see a lot of people supporting Nazism and supporting the death of Jews. Do you, do you think America is, is the same as when it was 
back in the 40s when you were actually fighting Hitler? Or what would you recommend America do to, to handle this anti-Semitism? I think and ending anti-Semitism, the only way you can end it is through education, teaching and showing people that Jews are just like any other people. They may stand out because they may be a smaller group and uh, they, they become successful, but there are people that are not Jewish that are successful. The big problem, I think, with anti-Semitism anti-anybody is the person thinks that the next person is getting over on him, is getting something that he should have. It's the same with uh, when we had the Civil War with the black and the white. The white guy felt at that time the black is under him, shouldn't get ahead, shouldn't get uh, educated or anything like that. The same thing with that hater, that anti-Semite, feels that the Jew shouldn't have anything different from him. There are many people like that. Although, I don't know how many there are, because there's a lot of undercurrent that you don't see or hear. All right. And finally, is there any message that you would like to say any life lessons that you've learned that you think are important for the younger generations to hear? What I have learned is that this business of war never ends anything. It's a constant, constant battle. People are hurt, people are killed, families are destroyed. The big thing in trying to get things done is talking, negotiating, talking, trying to show the other person, let's make a deal this way, that way, instead of picking arms, up arms and really going to kill the next guy. Doesn't happen. All right, we fought a World War II. We did a, a terrible job in Japan with the bombs. You almost killed a whole country. Things were good for a number of years. We didn't have any wars, but all of a sudden, it's coming back again now. Why do you think that is? I really, I really don't know, but I think there are people that are getting to the point where they think they're better than the next guy and that they have to rule, and the next guy, whether he's Jewish or something else, no good, I'm going to take over. Those people are not going to get ahead of me. All right. Or is there anything else that you think I missed or you'd like to speak about? Well, the only thing I'd like to speak about is I th I think that war will never solve anything. It'll be a continuous fight. We will always have armies, we will always try to protect ourselves, but I don't think it, it ends anything. Education is one of the things that we should have. People should be taught history, people should be taught that we are all the same that we should all be able to try to get along. And you're asking me, my philosophy is be nice, the next guy will be nice too, you hope. Okay. All right, Harold, thank you very much. All right, I hope you have enough. Yeah. Uh, that was nice, short. Sure.